Fille by Guy de Maupassant My dear friend, you cannot understand it by any possible means, you say, and I perfectly believe you. You think I am going mad? It may be so, but not for the reasons which you suppose. Yes, I am going to get married, and I will tell you what has led me to take that step. My ideas and my convictions have not changed at all. I look upon all legalized cohabitation as utterly stupid. For I am certain that nine husbands out of ten are cuckolds, and they get no more than their deserts for having been idiotic enough to fetter their lives and renounce their freedom in love, the only happy and good thing in the world, and for having clipped the wings of fancy which continually drives us on toward all women. You know what I mean. More than ever, I feel that I am incapable of loving one woman alone, because I shall always adore all the others too much. I should like to have a thousand arms, a thousand mouths, and a thousand temperaments to be able to strain an army of these charming creatures in my embrace at the same moment. And yet, I am going to get married. I may add that I know very little of the girl who is going to become my wife tomorrow. I have only seen her four or five times. I know that there is nothing unpleasant about her, and that is enough for my purpose. She is small, fair, and stout. So, of course, the day after tomorrow... I shall ardently wish for a tall, dark, thin woman. She is not rich and belongs to the middle classes. She is a girl, such as you may find by the gross, well adapted for matrimony, without any apparent faults, and with no particularly striking qualities. People say of her, Mademoiselle Lejoie is a very nice girl, and tomorrow they will say, What a very nice woman Madame Raymond is. She belongs, in a word, to that immense number of girls who make very good wives for us till the moment comes when we discover that we happen to prefer all other women to that particular woman we married. Well, you will say to me, what on earth did you get married for? I hardly like to tell you the strange and seemingly improbable reason that urged me on to this senseless act. The fact, however, is that I am frightened of being alone. I don't know how to tell you or to make you understand me, but my state of mind is so wretched that you will pity and despise me. I do not want to be alone any longer at night. I want to feel that there is someone close to me, touching me, a being who can speak and say something, no matter what it be. I wish to be able to awaken somebody by my side, so that I may be able to ask some sudden question even, if I feel inclined, so that I may hear a human voice and feel that there is some waking soul close to me, someone whose reason is at work, so that when I hastily light the candle, I may see some human face by my side, because, because I am ashamed to confess it, because I am afraid of being alone. Oh, you don't understand me yet. I am not afraid of any danger, 
if a man were to come into the room, I should kill him without trembling. I am not afraid of ghosts, nor do I believe in the supernatural. I am not afraid of dead people, for I believe in the total annihilation of every being that disappears from the face of this earth. Well, yes, w well, it must be told. I am afraid of myself, afraid of that horrible sensation of incomprehensible fear. You may laugh if you like. It is terrible, and I cannot get over it. I am afraid of the walls, of the furniture, of the familiar objects which are animated, as far as I am concerned, by a kind of animal life. Above all, I am afraid of my own dreadful thoughts, of my reason which seems as if it were about to leave me, driven away by a mysterious and invisible agony. At first, I feel a vague uneasiness in my mind, which causes a cold shiver to run all over me. I look round, and of course nothing is to be seen, and I wish there were something there, no matter what as long as it were something tangible. I am frightened, merely because I cannot understand my own terror. If I speak, I am afraid of my own voice. If I walk, I am afraid of I know not what behind the door, behind the curtains, in the cupboard, or under my bed. And yet, all the time I know there is nothing anywhere, and I turn round suddenly because I am afraid of what is behind me, although there is nothing there, and I know it. I get agitated. I feel that my fear increases, and so I shut myself up in my own room, get into bed, and hide under the clothes, and there, cowering down, rolled into a ball, I close my eyes in despair, and remain thus for an indefinite time, remembering that my candle is alight on the table by my bedside, and that I ought to put it out, and yet I dare not do it. It is very terrible, is it not, to be like that? Formerly, I felt nothing of all that. I came home quite comfortably and went up and down in my rooms without anything disturbing my calmness of mind. Had anyone told me that I should be attacked by a malady, for I can call it nothing else, of most improbable fear, such a stupid and terrible malady as it is, I should have laughed outright. I was certainly never afraid of opening the door in the dark. I used to go to bed slowly, without locking it, and never got up in the middle of the night to make sure that everything was firmly closed. It began last year in a very strange manner, on a damp autumn evening, when my servant had left the room, after I had dined, I asked myself what I was going to do. I walked up and down my room for some time, feeling tired without any reason for it, unable to work, and without enough energy to read. A fine rain was falling, and I felt unhappy. A prey to one of those fits of casual despondency which make us feel inclined to cry, or to talk, no matter to whom, so as to shake off our depressing thoughts. 
I felt that I was alone and that my rooms seemed to me to be more empty than they had ever been before. I was surrounded by a sensation of infinite and overwhelming solitude. What was I to do? I sat down, but then a kind of nervous impatience agitated my legs, so that I got up and began to walk about again. I was feverish, for my hands, which I had clasped before me, as one often does when walking slowly, almost seemed to burn one another. Then suddenly a cold shiver ran down my back, and I thought the damp air might have penetrated into my room, so I lit the fire for the first time that year, and sat down again and looked at the flames. But soon it felt that I could not possibly remain quiet. So I got up again, and determined to go out, to pull myself together, and to seek a friend to bear me company. I could not find anyone, so I went on to the boulevards to try and meet some acquaintance or other there. I was wretched everywhere, and the wet pavement glistened in the gaslight, while the oppressive mist of the almost impalpable rain lay heavily over the streets and seemed to obscure the lights from the lamps. I went on slowly, saying to myself, I shall not find a soul to talk to. I glanced into several cafes, from the Madeleine as far as the Faubourg Poissonniere, and saw many unhappy-looking individuals sitting at the tables, who did not seem even to have enough energy left to finish the refreshments they had ordered. For a long time, I wandered aimlessly up and down, and about midnight, I started off for home. I was very calm and very tired. My concierge opened the door at once, which was quite unusual for him, and I thought that another lodger had no doubt just come in. When I go out, I always double lock the door of my room. Now, I found it merely closed, which surprised me, but I supposed that some letters had been brought up for me in the course of the evening. I went in and found my fire still burning, so that it lighted up the room a little. In the act of taking up a candle, I noticed somebody sitting in my armchair by the fire, warming his feet with his neck toward me. I was not in the slightest degree frightened. I thought very naturally that some friend or other had come to see me. No doubt the porter, whom I had told when I went out, had lent him his own key. In a moment I remembered all the circumstances of my return, how the street door had been opened immediately, and that my own door was only latched and not locked. I could see nothing of my friend but his head. He had evidently gone to sleep while waiting for me, so I went up to him to rouse him. I saw him quite clearly. His right arm was hanging down, and his legs were crossed, while his head, which was somewhat inclined to the left of the armchair, seemed to indicate that he was asleep. Who can it be? I asked myself. I could not see clearly, as the room was rather dark. So I put out my hand to touch him on the shoulder, and it came in contact with the back of the chair. There was nobody there. The seat was empty. I fairly jumped with fright. For a moment, I drew back as if some terrible danger had suddenly appeared in my way. Then I turned round again. 
impelled by some imperious desire to look at the armchair again. I remained standing upright, panting with fear, so upset that I could not collect my thoughts and ready to drop. But I am naturally a cool man and soon recovered myself, I thought. It is a mere hallucination, that is all. And I immediately began to reflect about this phenomenon. Thoughts fly very quickly at such moments. I had been suffering from hallucination. That was an incontestable fact. My mind had been perfectly lucid and had acted regularly and logically, so there was nothing the matter with the brain. It was only my eyes that had been deceived. They had had a vision. One of those visions which lead simple folk to believe in miracles. It was a nervous accident to the optical apparatus, nothing more. The eyes were rather overwrought, perhaps. I lit my candle, and when I stooped down to the fire in doing so, I noticed that I was trembling, and I raised myself up with a jump, as if somebody had touched me from behind. I was certainly not by any means reassured. I walked up and down a little, and hummed a tune or two. Then I double-locked my door, and felt rather reassured. Now, at any rate, nobody could come in. I sat down again and thought over my adventure for a long time. Then I went to bed and put out my light. For some minutes all went well. I lay quietly on my back. Then an irresistible desire seized me to look round the room, and I turned on to my side. My fire was nearly out, and the few glowing embers threw a faint light onto the floor by the chair, where I fancied I saw the man sitting again. I quickly struck a match, but I had been mistaken, for there was nothing there. I got up, however, and hid the chair behind my bed, and tried to get to sleep as the room was now dark. But I had not forgotten myself for more than five minutes when in my dream I saw all the scene which I had witnessed as clearly as if it were reality. I woke up with a start, and having lit the candle, sat up in bed without venturing even to try and go to sleep again. Twice, however, sleep overcame me, for a few moments in spite of myself, and twice I saw the same thing again, till I fancied I was going mad. When day broke, however, I thought that I was cured, and slept peacefully till noon. It was all past and over. I had been feverish, had had the nightmare. I don't know what. I had been ill, in a word. But yet I thought that I was a great fool. I enjoyed myself thoroughly that evening. I went and dined at a restaurant. Afterward, I went to the theater and then started home. But as I got near the house, I was seized by a strange feeling of uneasiness once more. I was afraid of seeing him again. I was not afraid of him, not afraid of his presence, in which I did not believe, but I was afraid of being deceived again. I was afraid of some fresh hallucination, afraid lest fear should take possession of me. For more than an hour, I wandered up and down the pavement. Then I thought that I was really too foolish and returned home. I panted so that I could scarcely get upstairs and remained standing outside my door for more than ten minutes. Then, suddenly, I took courage and pulled myself together. 
I inserted my key into the lock and went in with a candle in my hand. I kicked open my half-open bedroom door and gave a frightened look toward the fireplace. There was nothing there. Ah, what a relief and what a delight. What deliverance. I walked up and down briskly and boldly, but I was not altogether reassured and kept turning round with a jump. The very shadows in the corners disquieted me. I slept badly and was constantly disturbed by imaginary noises, but I did not see him. No, that was all over. Since that time, I have been afraid of being alone at night. I feel that the specter is there, close to me, around me, but it has not appeared to me again. And supposing it did, what would it matter, since I do not believe in it and know that it is nothing? It still worries me, however, because I am constantly thinking of it. His right arm hanging down and his head inclined to the left like a man who was asleep. Enough of that, in heaven's name. I don't want to think about it. Why, however, am I so persistently possessed with this idea? His feet were close to the fire. He haunts me. It is very stupid, but so it is. Who and what is he? I know that he does not exist except in my cowardly imagination, in my fears and in my agony. There, enough of that. Yes, it is all very well for me to reason with myself, to stiffen myself, so to say. But I cannot remain at home because I know he is there. I know I shall not see him again. He will not show himself again. That is all over. But he is there all the same, in my thoughts. He remains invisible. But that does not prevent his being there. He is behind the doors, in the closed cupboards, in the wardrobe, under the bed, in every dark corner. If I open the door or the cupboard, if I take the candle to look under the bed and throw a light onto the dark places, he is there no longer. But I feel that he is behind me. I turn round, certain that I shall not see him, that I shall never see him again. But he is nonetheless behind me. It is very stupid. It is dreadful. But what am I to do? I cannot help it. But if there were two of us in the place, I feel certain that he would not be there any longer, for he is there just because I am alone, simply and solely because I am alone. End of He 